Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Her Excellency, Mrs. Emine Erdogan, welcome. Hoş geldiniz. We are honored to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining this special dinner event on Turkey's role in humanitarian challenges of our time. My name is Kadir Üstün. I am the executive director of the SETA Foundation at Washington, D.C. On behalf of the SETA Foundation, I would like to welcome you all. Today, we are proud to host Her Excellency, Mrs. Emine Erdogan, the First Lady of Turkey. Her Excellency will deliver the keynote address. As you all know, Mrs. Erdogan has been at the forefront of numerous humanitarian initiatives, especially with respect to women and children refugees. Mrs. Erdogan's humanitarian leadership has made Turkey's efforts much more robust and consistent over the years. We look forward to hearing your remarks on this theme. As the SETA Foundation, we would like to thank her once again for her leadership and her willingness to share her views with us tonight. I would also like to thank our distinguished panelists for joining this discussion. We will have an opportunity to hear both the practitioners and analysts' perspectives. We hope that this event leads to a better understanding and more importantly, more action on humanitarian challenges. I would like to thank my colleagues here at SETA DC and the SETA Foundation in Turkey for their efforts in organizing this event. Uh, I also want to thank our co-sponsor, Musiad USA, for joining us in this effort. Now I'd like to invite the president of Musiad USA, Mustafa Tunjar, to the podium. Thank you. Your Excellency, Mrs. Emine Erdogan, Dear panelists and distinguished guests, I would like to welcome you all. My name is Mustafa Tunjer. I am the president of Independent Industrialist Businessmen Association of USA, which is we called Musiat USA. I'm a businessman. I do travel a lot from north to south, from east to west. And every time when I do travel, I find myself in a conversation of Turkey's billions of dollars of humanitarian aids and so many times i've been asked what is the turkey's determination behind those uh, humanitarian aids actually answer is very easy very simple because of our history because of our culture because of our people because of because of our leadership and because of our beliefs Turkey is not the richest country. Yes, this is the true. But at the same time, the Turkey is the largest donor of humanitarian aid all around the world. <laughs> Turkey expand its hand from Myanmar to Somalia, from Palestine to Rohingya. Whichever country you go, Whenever, whenever you see the needed people, you can see Turkey's hand over there. Turkey as a nation is a philanthropic nation with a deep-rooted history of charitable foundations, which is deeply related to Turkish people's religious orientation. We as a Musiat declare 2018 the African year. Our goal in this project to improve our commercial relationships with our African brothers and sisters with whom we have historical relations. Africa had a long history of colonialism and we believe that's enough. This is time for Africa for stand up and produce for its own people. As a Musiat, we believe, we believe that while we are making money out of business, also we should contribute as well out of to our money to our communities, to the countries that we are making business with. 
Those we put the development of mechanization and, and irrigation systems, development of agriculture industry, the employment of young people, and the, and the development of women in rural areas, and food safety and nutrition at the forefront as our priority in Africa. Your Excellency, Ms. Emine Erdogan, you are a true example of philanthropist, and you inspire all of us. I would particularly mention your Rohingya visit. That's very important visit. While most countries' officials were afraid to even go to Rohingya, you did it, Excellency. You were there. And that was the true inspiration. Thank you for that. Thank you much. Thank you very much all for being here. And now I would like to invite to microphone General Coordinator of SETA Foundation, Mr. Burhanettin Duran. Kıymetli misafirler, bu güzel New York akşamında bizimle beraber Sayın Hanımefendi, Emine Erdoğan Hanımefendi bizimle beraber kendileri Türkiye'nin yardımlarını Suriye'den Arakan'a kadar ulaştırmada elinde gelen isim, bir anne şefkatiyle mazlumların yanında yer alan e, Sayın Hanımefendi'yi kürsüye davet ediyorum. Değerli hanımefendiler, beyefendiler, hepinizi en kalbi duygularla selamlıyor. İnsani yardım temalı bu, top, bu anlamlı toplantıda sizlerle olmaktan büyük bir memnuniyet duyuyorum. Somali'de, Yemen'de, Suriye'de, Gazze'de, Myanmar'da baskı ve zulüm altında yaşayan tüm kardeşlerimi buradan selamlıyorum. Yaşadığımız çağda böylesine büyük acılar yaşanırken yapabildiğimiz konuşmaktan, sebepleri kritik etmekten çok daha öte şeyler olmalı. İnsani yardım bu anlamda insanlık vicdanının en anlamlı fiilidir. Uluslararası toplumun eklem yerlerini sağlamlaştıran sorunlara karşı dayanıklılığı arttıran bir eylemdir. Bir başka millet için harekete geçtiğimizde bizden farklı olan ile üst bir kimlikle buluşuruz. Bu da empati yeteneğimizi geliştirir. Böylece adil ve barışçıl bir dünyanın temellerini atmış oluruz. Mevlana'nın ifadesiyle bir mum diğer mumu tutuşturmakla ışığından hiçbir şey kaybetmez. Değerli misafirler, Global İnsani Yardım Raporu 2017'de 134 ülkede tahmini 201.5 milyon insanın insani yardıma ihtiyacı olduğunu ortaya koyuyor. Bu rakam işin sadece görünen kısmı. Kayda geçmemiş savaşlarda ve çatışmalarda gelecek umudunu kaybetmiş nice insan var yer kürede. Öylesine büyük adaletsizlikler var ki bu sorunları hesaplarla değil verdikçe çoğalan merhamet sevgi ve vicdan duygusuyla çözebiliriz. İşte bu nedenle Türkiye'nin insani yardım vizyonu kredilere değil, tam anlamıyla insani yardıma dayanmaktadır. Türkiye'yi insani yardım konusunda milli gelire oranla birinci yapan da bu hesapsız, kitapsız cömertliktir. Türkiye'nin güneydoğusundaki ki bir şehrimiz bunun en çarpıcı örneğidir. Kilis'te Suriyeli mülteci sayısı yerel nüfusu aşmıştır. Kilis bu yönüyle bombalardan kaçan kadınlar ve çocuklar söz konusu olduğunda bütün hesapların bırakıldığı, merhametin her yeri kapladığı sembolik bir e, sembolik bir anlama bürünür. 
ekmeğin, sofranın, evin, şehrin paylaşıldığı bir evrene dönüşür. Türk insanının tarihten gelen vakıf geleneği ile güçlendirdiği bu paylaşımcı karakteri, Türkiye'yi uluslararası toplumun yükünü sırtlayan bir ülke haline getirmiştir. AFAD, Kızılay, TİKA gibi kurumlarımızın yanı sıra sivil toplum kuruluşlarımızın katkılarıyla Türkiye'nin yardım eli her yere ulaşmaktadır. 3,5 milyon Suriyeli mülteciyi misafir etmek yanında Afrika'da, Gazze'de, Myanmar'da hep Türkiye vardır. 2010'da Pakistan'a, 2011'de Somali'ye, 2012'de Myanmar'a gidip yaşanan insani dramları yerinde görmüş biri olarak uluslararası toplumun sınıfta kaldığını ifade etmek isterim. Keza 2017'de Arakanlı Müslümanlara yapılan zulüm içimizi titretmiş fakat tüm dünya konuya gereken önemi göstermemiştir. Son Myanmar ziyaretimde gördüklerim masum çocukların çaresizlikleri değil, dünyanın merhametsizlikten can çekişmesi halidir. Orada konuşup dertleştiğim kadınlar, dünyayı bekleyen gerçek tehlikenin vicdan yoksunluğu olduğunu göstermiştir. Böyle bir vasatta insani yardımlar, insanlık kandilini yeniden tutuşturma anlamını taşır. Türkiye, kimi afetlerde ev sahibi ülkeden daha önce afet ulaşabilen, dinamik ve esnek bir insani yardım yapılanmasına sahiptir. Dünyada afetlere müdahale noktasında en ileri ülke olduğumuzu söyleyebilirim. 2010 yılında Pakistan'da yaşanan sel felaketi sonrası Türkiye'nin ilk yardım eli uzatan ülke olması bunun ilk akla gelen örneğidir. Myanmar'da 2012 ve 2017 yıllarında sıcak biçimde yaşanan insani dramlar en çok Türkiye'de yankı bulmuştur. Devlet ve millet olarak yaptığımız seferberlikler uluslararası toplumu harekete geçirmiş, dünya bu soykırıma nihayet kulak vermiştir. Bu noktada önemli bir noktayı işaret etmek isterim. İnsani yardım politikaları yardım alanın bağımlılığını arttıracak şekilde olmamalıdır. Bizim insani yardımdan anladığımız yardım kolileri ve sırada bekleyen muhtaçlar değildir. Acil durumlarda afet zedelere yapılan katkının ötesinde krizlerin önlenmesi, kalkınma destekleriyle bağımlılıkların azaltılmasıdır. Bu anlamda insani yardım anlayışının kalkınma merkezli çalışmalar içermesi son derece önemlidir. Suriye'de kanayan yaraya yaptığımız pansuman, Suriyeli mültecilere barınma yeri sağlamaktan ötedir. Yarıdan fazlasını kadınların ve çocukların oluşturduğu kamplarda, kadınların meslek edinip hayata tutunmasını önemsiyoruz. Kuaförlükten bilgisayar beceri, becerilerine pek çok alanda mesleki kurslar veriyoruz. Gelişim ve hobi kurslarıyla savaşlarda zarar görmüş kadınları hem rehabilite ediyor hem de kendilerini keşfetmelerini sağlıyoruz. Aynı şekilde çocukların eğitimden mahrum kalmaması kadar gençlerin üniversite eğitimlerine devam edebilmelerinin yollarını da açmaya çalışıyoruz. Keza Afrika'ya yaptığımız insani yardımlar kalkınma destekli yardımlardır. Yaygın ifadeyle balık vermekten çok balık tutmayı öğretiyoruz onlara. Afrika'nın kendi potansiyelini keşfetmesini sağlayacak eğitim ve ekipman desteği veriyoruz. Değerli misafirler, çeyrek asırdır Bosna'dan Afganistan'a, Irak'tan Suriye'ye, Somali'den Gazze'ye, İnsanlığın vicdanını sarsan nice 
olaylara şahit olduk. Binalarında mermi izleri hala duran şehirler gördük. Yerinden yurdundan edilmiş mazlum çocukların uykuya daldığı kampları ziyaret ettik. Yoksullukla savaşan sokaklardan geçtik. İçimiz acıdı, yüreğimiz sızladı. Ama aynı mekanlarda nerede bir çığlık olsa sıcak yatağından kalkıp oraya koşan merhamet ve vicdan abidesi insanlar da gördük. Hayatını insani yardıma adamış nice güzel insan var dünyada. Her beş saniyede bir çocuk açlıktan ölüyor ve her sabah güneş yeniden doğabiliyorsa bu onların aydınlığıdır. Merhametin olduğu yerde en acı zehirler zararsız kalır. Merhamet bütün kötülüklerin pan zehiridir. İnsani yardım çabalarının bütün sessiz ve isimsiz kahramanlarını huzurlarınızda saygıyla selamlıyorum. İyi ki varlar, iyi ki varsınız. Bu çatı altında buluşan bu toplulukta varlığını insanlığa yardım fikriyle anlamlandıran güzel insanlardan oluşuyor. İnanıyorum ki el ele verir, merhameti, vicdanı çoğaltırsak adaleti de tesis etmiş olacağız. Bu duygu ve düşüncelerle hepinizi en kalbi muhabbetlerimle selamlıyorum. Bu anlamlı toplantıya ev sahipliği yapan SETA'ya çok teşekkür ediyorum. Bu buluşmanın birbirimize güç verdiğine inanıyorum. Toplantıya katkı sağlayan çok kıymetli konuşmacılarımıza da şükranlarımı sunuyorum. Sağ olun, var olun, Allah'a emanet olun. Good evening to the First Lady and to all of our esteemed scholars and guests who have gathered here from across the world to participate in this most important gathering. I bring greetings as the third daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz. I'm an author of five books for children and high school students geared towards understanding their young purpose and towards celebrating their young leadership across the world. I'm an adjunct professor at the College of John Jay for criminal justice, and I take great pride encouraging the values my parents instilled in their six daughters and to my six students. In the 1960s, my father traveled the globe searching for solutions to the human condition that could oppress and repress his fellow brother, sister, and children. My mother, whom was a prolific and compassionate educator, spent countless hours helping young people realize their roles as global citizens. This evening, I am most honored and humbled to join you in my home state of New York, excited to strategize on how we can collectively work to address the multitude of global humanitarian challenges with which we are facing, my prayer is that all of us will leave better educated about the challenges along with Turkey's exemplary role bringing humanitarian relief to all of our brothers and sisters and their children who are struggling. <laughs> and whose human, human dignity is critically challenged around the globe. My father said, when you teach a man, you teach a community. And when you teach a woman, you raise a nation. And this evening, I have the distinct honor to be here with this extraordinary woman, this beautiful first lady who is my hero. Her Excellency, Emine Erdogan and her beautiful daughter, thank you so much for including me. And now I believe dinner will be served.
And if we can invite our panelists here, Dr. Mehmet Oz, Professor Burhanettin Duran, Bassan Barabandi, and Dr. Mehmet Gülloğlu. Okay, uh, good evening again. And while you are enjoying your coffee and dessert, we will start discussing. It will be a rather informal conversation about a very formal and significant topic in regards to Syrian refugees, in regards to Turkey's humanitarian assistance. As uh, Professor uh, Branettin Duran mentioned in his introductory speech, Madam First Lady recently earned a humanitarian uh, recognition service award. And we want to, con as SETA, we want to congratulate her again. And we want to say that uh, both Turks in diaspora and in Turkey are very proud of uh, her and Mr. President. And thank you for your efforts for the humanitarian assistance around the world. <laughs> now we will start the conversation with uh, Dr. Oz. And as you may, if you are following his tweet, which millions of people in America follows, uh, he was recently in one of the refugee camps. Actually, he visited some refugee camps, both in Turkey and in Syria, in Nizip, in Aziz, I guess. Yes. And let's start with you and let's share us your insight about what's going on in those camps and what was your impression? So I, at a high level, I have always believed we're judged as a people uh, by how we take care of those who need the most. And so I went to see the Syrian refugees in part because I was going to do uh, and I didn't go with press. I went by myself with my wife. Uh, it ended, ended up there was a press group there, but it wasn't organized. I purposely wanted to go and just see what was happening when there's not a lot of attention. And on the Turkish side of the border, I was very surprised. There were schools, community centers. There was a sense of belonging. There were homes which are air conditioned, which is a very big uh, advance in July in, uh, Niz you know, in, the, in the south in, in Nizip. Um, but mostly, I was dealing with young children, because there are so many young children that are caught in this, and trying to see how they were dealing with the trauma of having a life where, for six years, they've had nothing but uh, tricks played on them. This is not what a 12-year-old is used to dealing with in life. And it creates post-traumatic stress disorder, which takes a lot of attention. But what caught my attention the most was how much the Syrian healers, doctors, nurses, were getting involved in the process. And I met a Syrian physician, I put him in this, this video that we had on my show this week that was told, he's an obstetrician taking care of women with babies. He was told that it, by uh, ISIS, Daesh, that if he took care of women, if he touched a woman, they would kill him. And he said, well, who's going to take care of the women? And they said, it's none of your business. And he escaped in the middle of the night, fled to Turkey, and he's one of hundreds of Syrian physicians who have gotten permission from the Turkish government to practice medicine inside of Turkey, which is a very big deal. So that was all very impressive to me. As sad and tragic as it was, uh, I, it was lifted up when I heard this. But then I went across Kilis to Sichu, to the, in the Syrian side. And here it's very different. There, the camp I went to had about 11,000 people, 5,000 children, half children. They're in the streets. The, it's, a, it's a war economy. They uh, have militias that are carrying guns. I was passed by young 14-year-old kids who had guns and rifles, machine guns. And you know, 14-year-old children, you, know, you don't want to have them armed to kill that many people, but that's the only security force they had in those areas. The children there are caught in an environment where they will either turn into doctors, nurses, world leaders, humanitarians, or they'll become terrorists. And we control that. They don't. If we show them a path, if we take away some of the distress that we know hinders their ability to learn, if we give them a little stability so they can form relationships, then they can thrive in the world. And my biggest concern for Syria in particular, but this is true in many refugee situations, the Rohingya I think faces in, in Myanmar, is if you don't provide a little support to these young people, we lose a generation. So one day what will happen will happen politically but we have to pay the price for the rest of these children's lives. Do you want to say a few words about your project? Thank you for asking. Yeah. Uh, I am a, a member of a, a group here called the Ellis Island Society. It's the most prestigious society for immigrants to this country. It was created by Ronald Reagan. 
And uh, there are many Armenians and Greeks, Turks, many people there. And they all feel the same desire to help. And the idea is that we can collect support from Americans <coughs> who came from other countries but understand the area. And by doing that, we break down the natural barriers. For example, we are getting a lot of Armenians who want to help in Syria. And there are lots of Turks who obviously want to help. So if you both help, maybe it actually helps their native countries also make closer relationships. So out of a tragedy like Syria, we can actually bring people together, unify them in a much more important way than they have been historically. And we have this already approved. Um, I was talking to Her Excellency about this early at the table. I think we're going to facilitate this process so we get the approvals required. I must thank Mehmet Yulolo, who together with my uh, close friend and my trainee, Halit Yerebakan, took me to the camps, but they are spearheading this work. But just to give you an idea of Mehmet, so he won't, he's too humble. He le leads Afad, but also was, used to lead the Turkish Kuzulay, the Red Crescent. But we saw young children. Uh, there's a picture that became in the press. It was, there was a picture of our president on the wall in this camp, on the little tin wall, and believed that the two-year-old child who had a heart defect. And we we're listening to see what the defect is. But he took these children that we helped, another 12-year-old, uh, Meltem, was her, Zeynab rather, Zeynab, who has a congenital defect that will prevent her from growing up to be an adult. Her lips are blue. The operation to fix her, easy. I do the operation. And we're helping some of these cases, but they're emblematic, they're symbolic of what, this re that, what is required, but what we can do. We all have the power. I think we need more people to realize that, and the ability to shine light of it, which is what this organization collaboration does, is incredibly powerful. So kudos. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will get back to you about your uh, trip, but now I want to go to uh, Burhan Ettin Duran and tell us a little bit about the Turkey's policy about the Syrian refugees and what happened so far. Thank you, Kılıç. Uh, as we all know, Turkey's humanitarian efforts uh, around the world under the leadership of President Erdogan and Her Excellency the First Lady Emine Erdogan uh, actually have been an example for all countries to follow. Uh, because Turkish uh, humanitarianism has challenged many of the basic assumptions of traditional global aid. Uh, one of the imp uh, important aspects of this global aid program of advanced economies is that they often, the humanitarian aid is linked to politics. But Turkish efforts uh, refuse to make humanitarian aid conditional on political or strategic calculations. We have seen this effort in countries like Somalia or the Rohingya Muslims. All of them, uh, for Turkey, uh, it was just humanitarianism. Uh, we have another example in Syria. Uh, Turkey, you know, has spent uh, around 35 billion dollars and, and Turkey is hosting uh, 3.5 uh, million uh, Syrian refugees. But this is beyond the conventional uh, aiding refugees. Uh, actually, this crisis, Syrian conflict, uh, is the biggest humanitarian crisis since the World War II. And the Middle East has been dealing with large population issues. And it seems that this will continue to be a critical issue, uh, not just for Syrians, but also uh, some Afghans uh, and Iraqis are coming to Turkey. So this is a very critical issue. And of course, uh, this refugee issue, issue is not just a, an humanitarian issue, but at the same time, it's a security issue. But you know, uh, this issue of uh, refugee should be linked to uh, humanitarian development as well. Uh, as First uh, Lady uh, Emine Erdogan mentioned, this is very critical because you cannot just aiding the refugees. We have to develop them, uh, they sh education and, and other uh, uh, uh, activities. So Turkey in that sense, uh, again, is the example uh, for, for uh, refugee policies. Uh, Turkey has been a responsible power in its region, and Turkey's aid policy uh, is very critical for uh, the neighboring countries as well. Refugee camps is just one part of this policy, but uh, you know there are other parts of uh, Turkey's aid to, uh, for example, Syrians. 
you know, they, they live in, in many cities of Turkey, from Kilis to Gaziantep to Istanbul. In every part of Turkey, you can find Syrian refugees uh, in, uh, living there. And again, Turkey uh, is insisting uh, on the need that uh, refugees should just return without proper conditions established there. You know, you cannot force people to return to their homes if there is no uh, security at all. And in that terms, Turkey's example is uh, so much different from, for example, what European countries are doing. You know, not just in terms of the quality of the camps, but also as a policy, as an open policy. Uh, you know, they are human beings, and uh, it's beyond your calculations of security. Your, it's beyond of your economic conditions as well. So uh, today, much of Europe is extremely fearful of refugees, and they do not even seem interested in helping Turkey. But Turkey, even there is no help coming from Europe or any, any, anywhere else, very uh, intent on keeping uh, refugees uh, in, in the conditions of, uh, in the human conditions. This is the United Nations week here in New York City. The international community is coming together to address some of these challenges around the world. But uh, as, far, as far as I believe, uh, we are so lucky that we are not just listening to the uh, words of world leaders, uh, certainly with the exception of uh, our president. Uh, today, we, tonight, we, we are hosting uh, First Lady Emine Erdogan, uh, who did many things for the refugees and uh, in this field of humanitarian aid. So we are luckier than uh, listening to other uh, leaders. Uh, well, uh, this, uh, problem, this refugee problem, I think, uh, calls for an international effort like a Marshall Plan for the entire region. Turkey should not be left alone in handling this crisis because, you know, uh, there can be many other refugee problems. If uh, the ceasefire in Idlib was not uh, accomplished, there will be more refugees coming to Turkey. So this is becoming a, uh, a heavy burden on the shoulders of Turkey. So we need uh, much more cooperation on the global level. Uh, and uh, in New York, uh, we want to uh, bring this issue to the attention uh, of the humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Burhan Ettin. And uh, now we will have uh, Bassam Barabandi, our Syrian friend. Bassam and me are not agree on everything in most no. instances, but we agree on one thing. The Syrian refugee crisis is something very near and dear for both of us. That's true. And we have been in multiple different events, multiple different talks with him. Right. And tell us about what happened in Syria and especially in the context of the recent crisis in Idlib. It's a very difficult question. Um, number one, what happens now in Syria Everybody knows, I just talked with the first lady, that every Syrian, when he meets any Turkish friend, official or friend in the market or in the official place, we just thank Turkey for hosting all the Syrian. Uh, it's, sometimes we feel it is too much because we spend most of our time thanking Turkey of what they had did for Syrian. But this is the reality. Uh, we were just talking now that part of all the sadness of the Syrian tragedy of having all these refugees in Turkey. Um, the, the, the good part, the side, the, the, the good part of this, or the positive part of this crisis, that Syrian and the Turks, they get together the way they will never think we will get together before. Now we have seven years of Syrian living in Turkey. As the doctor said, the way the Turks government and people did with the Syrian refugees we never, we didn't see it in Jordan, or we didn't see it in Lebanon, or in Egypt, or any other country. Um, this is this is not my word. This is the, the everybody words what they're saying like this. Now we, we I think we reached to the point where Turkey, with all its mechanism, especially human aid or political aid or military aid, we should move to the second step that bringing the Syrian back to home. 
we have certain areas in Syria that today is under Turkish influence. They provide some kind of security, stability, and we hope more to come that the Syrian NGOs, the Syrian American NGOs, or the Syrian Syrian NGOs that can provide the health sector, educational sector, with the stability that already exists, that will encourage the Syrian to come back home. Uh, Turkey today is able to provide the model for Syria after Assad. The Syria where it's ruled by Syrian, they decide what they want, what kind of system they want, and this is exactly what Assad hate to see. That's why whenever there is any attack from the regime on the Syrian, the first thing they destroy the hospitals, the schools, the infrastructure just to make the people flee. I think we are the time to reverse that action. Uh, and to bring all the Syrian back home, the, the Syrian want to back home. Uh, we have the knowledge. You see the Syrian in Turkey all over the world. In a way, they are educated people. They are smart. They can work. And they, I think they want to back home. If we talk about Syria and Turkey, I think the kind of relation where we have 3 million Syrian in Turkey for the last seven years when they come back home to Syria, they will bring all, all the common grounds with Turkey back to Syria like the language, like the infrastructure, that, like the way of thinking, like the banking system. So this is the good thing of this sad tragedy, that there, there is already integration between Syria and Turkey in the way that we, nobody thought about it years ago. Um, today, there are some people in, like Sam's organization. They were planning to have healthcare system that covered Idlib, Euphrates, Shields, and a free area, for example. I mean, we need, still we need Turkish support to implement that project, but this project is Syrian 100%. There's another Syrian who want to have Syria tel or Syrian telecommunication and internet in the same areas <coughs> to generate money to the local governments. So the people start to think how we come back to Syria, what kind of condition we need in Syria. Uh, there's the German foreign ministry, they make surveys for Syria in Jordan and in uh, Lebanon about what conditions that they will back home. And more than 65% of the people, they say, whenever there is stability and security enough, we will back home. And they ask them, is it good that you have now settlement some part in Dara area in, in the regime, Russian, Iranian control area? They say this is not stability. This is not the right condition to come back home. So when today, when the Russian and the Iranian the regime, they talk about reconstructions, um, the people themselves, they say, this is not the kind of new Syria we are looking for. This is not the kind of stabilization we are looking for or stability looking for, that we come back to the same regime that kill us and make us flee away. Here what I'm saying, that Turkey have the model. The area that under Turkish influence in Syria, they can make the model to tell the world that, look, we can do this. Uh, echo what you are said about the UN. Believe it or not, the UN OCHA system, they provide Assad regime with more than $20 billion. And they didn't give Turkey more than $3 billion. They are giving the killers openly, officially, on the records. And they don't give the, the neighboring country. And I will, I will be more frank. So when I talk with Dimas Tora himself, we, we always tell him that use this money at least to release the detainees, the Syrian detainees, the kids, the women. Make, make condition with the regime. We give you the money, but at least we have 400 kids less than 10 years. They are in jail. Just tell the regime that we need these people out. We have 1,700 girls and women. They are in jail. And the UN, all the UN, they say no. This is different from political process. The detainees things. So I'm trying to say how much difficult to go forward. Uh, <coughs> political things is always politics, is always wording, wasting time. The reality is completely different. People need stability. Need, they want to come back home. They believe that they have to come back home. Again, we have a model that we can develop, the Turkish model in Syria, where the people can come back. The Syrian themselves can come back. They can build their home. Uh, there's a lot of problems in the, in the world to go forward, but still we have a country that, like Turkey, that number one is rich, that doesn't have interest in Syrian wealth. They are strong, G20, so they can help us economically. Militarily, they are NATO, we are nothing. 
So they have the upper hand to help us and make the good model. And inshallah, hopefully the coming days will hold uh, a lot of good things in Syria, especially on Idlib issue. Very shortly, very shortly, how optimistic you are. You may recall this summer we were at a lunch in an embassy and yeah. you kept, it was an intimate lunch for five, six people and right. you kept bringing the issue of reconstruction and the uh, official kept telling that they don't have money for that. How optimistic you are? Look, this, the reconstruction is not about the money. Reconstruction is about are you feeling safe and stable to good? To you go yourself and build your home. I mean, this is stabilization and this reconstruction. Uh, I believe, luckily, that the United States now is taking the lead. They are very tough on Russia, on Iran. Um, it's very good that the United States and Turkey now, they re-engage uh, with each other on Syria. We saw this very clear in Idlib. Uh, the more United States and Turkey work together hand in hand, even in small projects, I mean, I mean Idlib is not small, but for Syria it's small, for, for that kind of relation between United States and Turkey is small. Uh, the more Turkey and the United States and the EU, EU work together to solve small pieces in Syria, the more we are in good shape. Um, the more we have different views and different policies, I think Syrian people pay the price. In the last three weeks, four weeks, we saw the United States approaching Turkey, in Idlib specifically, in Manbij, the second part. Uh, we saw there's some development, we saw there's some engagement, we saw there's some coordination, high-level coordination, that results that Idlib has been saved for a while. So the more this coordination will continue, I will be very happy and pessimistic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Thank you. Our last panelist is Mehmet Gülloğlu, and Mehmet Gülloğlu is the president of AFAD, and AFAD itself nowadays, we don't need to explain the, what it stands for because AFAD itself has become almost a brand for the protecting and saving the Syrian refugees around the world. And I have been in AFAD camps just like Dr. Oz and very impressed by the compassion of the AFAD uh, people who are working for AFAD and the passion of the leadership in AFAD. So uh, Mehmet and we have been in different panels as well from Ottawa to Toronto, from Chicago to DC. And Mehmet was always trying to explain what has been going on and what is the situation of the Syrian refugees right now. But I will ask Afa, uh, Mehmet a different question this time about the uh, Turkish humanitarian assistance beyond Syria. So uh, all of our panelists mentioned Syria, but we know that Turkey is doing a lot in Rohingya, in Somalia. Tell us a little bit about what you are doing in different parts of the world. First of all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for all distinguished individuals, participants, because tonight we choose to be here to, for discussing not easy things. And we, we will be able to choose for a fashion night in New York. And that's why for every individual, thank you very much for to be here. Uh, before passing to your question, just let me to draw you a bigger picture. I mean, in the world, in different continents, in different countries, because of different reasons, in every case we can discuss for hours, just for Syria, we can discuss for days or n and nights, and we cannot finish. It. Uh, in different parts of the world, there are crises, national crises. I mean, chronic crises, droughts, man-made disasters, refugees, wars. That's what really big problems. And as Turkey, we are trying to carry water for different uh, cases. Uh, but I think it will be much more in the next years, unfortunately, to say that. We know that statistically, uh, for the both natural disasters, and for the board, man-made disasters, it's increasing. And it is bringing much more millions of people will be affected from that. In Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, or in, in Palestine, more than 70 years, the crises are going on. And we are adding, as the world of the, and as all of us are adding some more crises. And as Turkey, we choose to be on the side of the humanity. In 2014, I was in the border of Syria and Turkey. Just in three days, we accepted 180,000 people. This was like a flood of people. And in Kobani. In, yeah, in Kobani events. And in Somalia in 2011, I witnessed with my own eyes that a baby who died because of hunger. Probably most of you watched from TVs, I mean, those or caricatures, that a, line, and a kid like a lion, like an really slim. But I witnessed with my own eyes. Or in Gaza, I witnessed 
I mean, the bombing and after bombing, how many people are injured? Unfortunately, dead bodies. I mean, really, I witnessed that. After those, really, thank you very much for our for uh, our president leadership and his encouragement and his really directions that Turkey chose to be on the side of humanity. For Syria, we didn't calculate it, uh, to accept 3.5 million from the first day. I mean, it's not something you can calculate. Or uh, as we were chatting with uh, Her Excellency uh, Emine Hanım, uh, that uh, Myanmar is really far away for us. But when we witness and we then increase communication within social media, you are trying to do your best. Uh, and after this, you are getting experience. Your teams are getting experience. Now we have one of team in Bangladesh, in Cox Bazar, which are hosting one million, nearly one million refugees from Myanmar. And inside Syria, our activities are going on. I will not touch on that side. For Palestine, and especially in these days, it, it, this is also a very hot topic because the US government cut the budget of UNRWA and uh, thousands of uh, teachers, thousands of medical doctors, salaries and support was going through that way. And we will do our best. We will continue for what we are uh, willing. But I think also for in the, in, in the individual level, in New York, at the same time, we are here for United Nations General Assembly for discussing the real humanities problem, a problem for different cases, including from on one side obesity, on the other side tuberculosis, on the other side Syria. But at the same time, New York is the capital of fashion, capital of luxury. That's why from individual level to the government level, I think what we can change, what we can do much more for a much more moral values, much more humanity side is, will, is very important. And as Turkey is spending our money for another country in humanitarian side or also in development side, is it sh showing the, your side, showing your really, how much you are really good in moral values. Uh, in technical level, in every crisis, uh, I mean in Africa, in, in South Sudan or in Somalia or in different cases, uh, we are trying to draw our model also. We have a model which also we were ch chatting with Burhan Etno uh, Professor Burhan, that uh, humanitarian development. I mean, at the same time, not only in emergency uh, support, also while we are doing, you know, everybody knows that, which is not easy, by the way. Uh, instead of giving fish, teach how to fish. Okay, but how? That's what, what we are trying to create, what we are trying to uh, develop is also Turkish model. And we a more sustainable model. Sustainable model, which is not easy, which is really risky at the same time. I mean, when we are working in Somalia, it is very difficult for other countries, even including UN organizations, to work inside Syria. And we know the risks. And unfortunately, we, when I was in Turkish Red Crescent, I was Director General of Turkish Red Crescent, we lost some of our local stuff. We are attacked. But we know those risks, and if you want to really increase the efficacy, we must be in there, in, like in that. Uh, again, it, it, was, it is criticized a lot that most of the UN organizations were in Nairobi, trying to I mean, implement their projects from another capital. Kenya, yes. That's why it wasn't easy. But we, we should be taking that risk. We should be really taking care of people, taking care of individuals. Unfortunately, I mean, I can talk hours, but none of us choose to born in US or in Turkey or in Afghanistan or in Somalia. Uh, what is the, I think, duty for us is if you choose, if we born in Turkey or if we are living in the US, what about the other side of the world? What about the people in Syria? What about people in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Myanmar? I mean, for example, for Myanmar uh, or Rohingyas people, they are now stateless. And uh, when we are talking about, for example, for Idlib case, we are happy in these days, but their condition, uh, in, in, in those camps are still continuing and we don't know that what will happen. They cannot go back. I mean, nobody knows that how many years they will stay in those camps. That's why we will do our best. We will continue and thank you very much again, uh, mainly with the President Erdogan because after that, Turkey's economy is developed and this is also unfortunately very much related with economy uh, for doing much more. And uh, with his encouragement, really, we are doing a lot. And personally, also, again, to Her Excellency Emine, Hanım, Emine Erdogan, that we were uh, with, uh, we went to together in the last visit previous year to the Myanmar camps, uh, Rohingya's camps, or again in Somalia. 
This is encouraging the other organizations. This is encouraging NGOs. This is encouraging individuals for donation doing much more. That's why instead of, okay, I mean, I'm not against fashion all. I'm not against, I mean, cosmetics, but just as the maybe last sentences uh, for comparing what is the today's world, for per year, for cosmetic sector, the world is spending $250 billion. But unfortunately, for humanitarian sector, it's something about $30 billion. That's why being much more beautiful is more important than for some people, uh, I mean, than hunger. That's why I think in individual level, in organization level, in also in government level, we should change. And as Turkey, for different regions, for different parts of the world, we will do our best. Can, I, can I add one yes. thing to what Go Mehmet said? It's beautifully stated, and I think it shows priorities. But uh, one of the unfortunate side benefits of multiple and increasing crises is that you start to develop tactics that work. And some of them are scalable. As an example, the way that the Turkish uh, southern border has managed the Syrian refugees is an example that could be scaled, I think, affordably, and not even for the amount that it costs for cosmetic surgery. Uh, we know that a lot of the challenges are post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, the people we work with, Jim Gordon and his group, working with Relief International in Turkey, it's a very easy system where you teach the teacher. So you, you get the Syrian, or at least Arabic-speaking, uh, people who are in the healthcare or education sector, teach them, they teach other people, and it spirals out. Uh, there's a program that the MacArthur Foundation just gave $100 million for to Sesame Street. Do you all know Sesame Street with the cartoons? Yeah. So they're using the Sesame Street to make an Arab language show that will teach the children how to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder and how to speak their language and do their math and be become bigger, give them a vision. And these are all opportunities now that allow us to get to a lot of refugees all at once. But we have to make sure we open the doors. And there's still local problems that last mile that limits it. Whether it's electronic devices or limitations on which NGOs can work in which areas. And I think we need to have a, a passport for everyone to be able to help who wants to help. If we make it easy for people to help, they will. And I, as you know, my, my, my mentor and partner, Oprah Winfrey, there's a poet that my Angelo used to work with her, and she would always say, be the rainbow in someone else's cloud. And there's a big cloud over so many parts of the world, but there are rainbows like Mehmet and others that, that I've been blessed to meet, and that uplifts humanity. What's allowed us to survive and thrive always has been the human safety net. And just an hour drive from Kiris, the border, is a place called Gebekli Tepe. Who's, who has heard of Gebekli Tepe? Potbelly Hill. <laughs> it's interesting. Oldest, <laughs> oldest civilization on the planet, 12,000 years old, three times older than the pyramids, four times older than Stonehenge. Um, and this is an area which is very sacred. But these people, 12,000 years ago, began to believe there were things bigger than them. And that evolved. Ultimately, this is the area where uh, Ibrahim, Abraham was, uh, had lived. So we have in our genes this need to bond together and believe in bigger ideas, solutions. And I'm optimistic for that reason that these crises, as painful as they are, remind us of that very humanity and bring out the best in some, even when we see the worst in others. Thank you very much. So uh, I have some questions, but uh, given the uh, excellence of panel here, I will waive my right to ask questions, <laughs> and I will uh, open the floor for uh, the audience to ask questions. Uh, please raise your hand and identify yourself. I will collect a set of questions. Uh, Madeline, let's start with the lady over there. Yes. Uh, good evening, and thank you for this beautiful panel. Uh, we are sitting in New York City and listening from exactly what is going on in uh, Turkey. And um, the more I am listening, I'm in love with Turkey. Like, I'm a Muslim. And this is my belief that the people, when the refugees, helping the refugee is the workshop. And that's the workshop is Turkey doing. And I'm so glad. Thank you. Um, question? First lady. And my question is, um, I'm from, uh, uh, my background is Bangladeshi. So I've been, in, in Bangladesh we have a large number of uh, Rohingya refugee. And this Rohingya, is, there is many Rohingya as well in, um, Turkey, and in Rohingya, these refugee women, many women, they've been raped, and they have children, 
from the raper. So how this situation is being uh, handling in um, Turkey and other humanitarian organization? I was planning to collect question, but this question is rather sensitive and important. Do you want to answer it, Mehmet? And then we will get Dr. Ross. I mean, it is a very dramatic question because uh, really in, in, in individual level, I mean, we had nearly the same problem in Bosnia or in, in some parts of Syria, but especially in Bosnia, mm -hmm. it was systematically rep is used as weapon, unfortunately. That's why we know that in uh, between the Rohingya refugees, some of them are really in that condition, and but they have babies now. Some of them are pregnant, some of them are had babies now, and it is now their baby. Most of them are really cared and taking services, uh, but it is not, I mean, easy to answer, by the way, uh, but it's a social problem, and especially, as Dr. Mehmedo said, in psychosocial support also, they need, because uh, the relation between mother and the kids, I mean, kids itself, mother itself, I mean, themselves, that's why it is not really. Uh, currently, we are trying to increase our health services, but I think we should do much more in psychosocial support. Dr. Ross. Probably you have something to say about that. I do. Well, the psychosocial issues are hugely important wherever in the world you are when you have that trauma. But I do believe that this is a place where adoption could be also of help. There are many families around the world who can't get the children. One third, I'll just speak about this country, one third of American couples are underbabied. They want more children than they can have. Part of this is because women are waiting a little longer, but there are other reasons why you can't have two children, you only can have one or none. So if there was an option to, to help women, if they wanted to, many won't, most won't, but if they wanted to allow the child to be adopted, we should make that really easy, which is the ba basic point that I'm hearing over. We, we should make it easy for the right thing to happen, because that way the right thing will happen. Let me get another question. Uh, gentleman over here. Good evening. Good evening. Just a minute, just a minute. Let's get the mic. Good evening. My name is Imam Alfred Muhammad. I'm a city councilman in the city of Linden, and I represent the Muslim American Association, that is the community of Imam Warthi Muhammad. We have a large number of professionals in our community, in the medical and the psychological, socio-psychological area, and I would like to see how we could fit in to help the issues that are facing the world. Most people look at us as seeking aid. But we want to see the experience that we've had in America, the 400 years, that we now have a major contribution to make. And we would like to see how we can formally offer our assistance to the crises in um, Syria and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm sure that everybody ha can do something. And uh, we will get a, a question, then uh, you can comment on this. Lady over there. Yes, we'll get you, Merve, and then. Uh, good evening. My name is Shev Kiesun. Uh, I live long time in New York, uh, but I am the Muslim. I worry about the Muslim, all the country which one day suffer. Uh, tonight, I am here. I have a question. Uh, Excellent, uh, uh, Mrs. Erdogan, she did a lot of uh, work. <coughs> Uh, for humanity, for refugee. But yesterday I listened to our president, uh, President Erdogan, uh, about the, he talked about the, again the, all the refugees, Somalia uh, and uh, Arakan, whatever, all the country, uh, uh, Syria, Lebanon, or uh, Philistine, uh, Palestinian. But he didn't mention about the, you know, in 1964, I believe, the East uh, Turkestan, they suffer from the China and Buddhist. They kill them, they put the, their, uh, all the men they put in the jail, and uh, they don't let the pray, they close the mosque, uh, 
Uh, they do everything for those people. These people, they suffer. Every day they cry. They All day in the internet, every day. Mm -hmm. We suffer. Actually, I am uh, very sick and tired. Since mm -hmm. What are I'll you going to you do can. about this Turkey? What That's is on our president do for these suffering people? Because always they say those people uh, <coughs> always. We got the question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Oz, you want to? No, no, no. I was just okay. encouraging you. Okay. And uh, Merve. One more, yeah. Um, so thank you so much for the panel. Um, I'm a PhD student, and actually I first want to thank you so much to all the Turkish government officials and also to Afat for everything that they do for refugees in Turkey. And because whenever I'm giving a lecture or when I'm making a presentation in school, I, like, I'm so proud of talking about all the things that my country is doing. So firstly, thank you so much. And secondly, my question is, uh, whenever we're talking about Syrians, uh, I mean, it's been seven years since they came. So we're still talking about integration, but we're talking about it in terms of Syrians. Uh, what are our policies regarding to Turkish people getting harmonized with Syrian people in Turkey? Thank you so much. Thank you. Before the last round, I want to uh, go to uh, Burhanettin Duran this time, since the question is about the integration of the Syrians in Turkey and the future of the Syrians in Turkey. <clears throat> well, the future of Syrians in, in Turkey uh, is, is an issue complicated because, you know, in general, refugees, when they come to a country, two-thirds of the refugees don't, don't want to go back. <clears throat> and this is a real issue to be uh, faced, uh, to be confronted uh, for, for Turkey. As far as I know, uh, uh, over, one, over one million uh, children are uh, attending to school. So Turkey is providing uh, education for Syrians together with Turkish uh, school children. So education is, uh, as far as I know, is something to be uh, solved. But what are, what are the other aspects of integration? As far as I know, uh, this issue of health is again uh, sold, uh, uh, sold for hospitals. For uh, another, another aspect is work, job. Uh, this is the most difficult one. Uh, it is improving, uh, but not totally solved. Refugee camps are okay, uh, but you know, the most important issue for Turkish Syrian refugees is to, uh, to govern people's reactions. You know, this is a heavy burden for, for Turkish people. So there can be some reactions uh, f f among Turkish population. So you have to control this. You have to educate the public opinion that refugees are at the same time contributing to our society by their workforce and by their presence. So it is, it is an issue uh, which is not comparable to what happened in European uh, societies. Just one million refugees to Europe, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and, and, and other uh, phobias uh, occurred and they are changing the uh, governments. Uh, you know, they created a trend for uh, right, far right movements, but when it comes to Turkey, uh, again thanks to uh, governing party and, and and its leadership, President Erdogan, this uh, this feelings, reactions against refugees could be uh, tensed and could be uh, governed easily. So in the future, without integration, this issue cannot be handled. Thank you. Uh, Bassam, do you want to say a few words about the, you have your Syrian friends in Turkey and they are talking about the integration and when we visit actually we see an informal integration process, what are their expectations? Yeah, I will, I will answer first the brother who talked about yeah. the American Muslims, how they can help the Syrian or whatever. We have very small and beautiful project with Arkansas uh, governor, or government, uh, state, where we allowed, we, we approached the schools uh, elementary schools uh, and we told them about the crisis in Syria and we told them to the student just to draw 
uh, pictures or write uh, letters for the Syrian in Turkey, the, ref the refugee camps, who they never met, they never talked, they never think. And they start to write the letters. We send it to Turkey, to certain school, and we make like partnership between the school in the United States with the Syrian school in the refugee camps. And we build <coughs> that kind of uh, relation, humanitarian relation, that you are refugees, we are in the United States, but we are a human, we support you, we support you. For the integration, I don't think, as, as the doctor mentioned, that most of the Syrian, as far as I know, they really <coughs> integrated the system. Turkey government, as, you know, they opened the system as much as they can for the Syrian to have decent life, even at that expense of the Turkish people. Uh, we know personally many friends who went to Germany, they get the residency in Germany and they come back to Turkey. So they didn't stay even in Germany. They stayed for the culture, for religion, for the language, for being close to Damascus or close to Syria. Um, I, I see the Syrian more integrated in Turkey. That's what I'm saying, that the relation today between Syria and Turkey, even it is very sad crisis, tragic crisis, the impact for 30 years that these people are becoming very close to each other in the way there is no way can imagine 10 years before. Um, so I, I think we are, again, people are appreciated what the government is doing. I don't think from Syria have a problem to integrate. They are asking more. Mm -hmm. They become greedy. They want government to deal with them, give them more facilities in the school, high school, universities, which are already doing. But again, if I'm Turkish government, I will try to build more inside Syria. It is the time for the Turkish government to use the fund to talk with the EU, with the American, with the UN, whatever, to rebuild inside Syria and let the Syrian to come back. These refugees, they are not Turks, they are Syrian. And their home is Syrian. They shouldn't, they should have the option to come back home. The, the, the area where, again, they have Turkish influence is the area we can make the model. Uh, the people are ready and willing to go. Thank you. Uh, before getting the last <coughs> round of questions, I want to uh, ask Mehmet if you can tell us about the Gerablus example and how the, after Euphrates shield in Gerablus and El Bab, uh, thousands of Syrians were basically voluntarily went back to Syria and are having a decent life and uh, social service over there. I mean, also it's mentioned by uh, my friend that first of all the peace is needed. Inside Syria that millions of people are still displaced, most of them was uh, mainly afraid from airstrikes. Mm -hmm. I mean, when they hear, I mean, when they hear about, I mean, any airplane's voice, they are really afraid. And when we visit also that it was safe area because no airstrikes was coming. What Turkey did in, in refugee area in, or in after Olive Branch operation is mainly put a limit. And in fact, in 2014, from political perspective, Turkey offered that. Let's put as an international safe coalition a safe zone area. And I mean, a safe zone area which no airplane will can come. But unfortunately, it, it couldn't be realized. <coughs> and extra millions of people should displace to other countries or inside, uh, inside Syria. What Turkey is doing, Turkey is building hospital. Turkey is repairing schools. Turkey is giving salaries for teachers and for doctors. Because first, I mean, first of all, of course, the peace, security is needed. This is very basic needs. And then the other the services are needed. If you cannot go to the, any hospital, if there's no hospital, and if you cannot reach the health services, how you can go back? That's why Turkey is supporting infrastructure, Turkey is supporting basic needs. After that, until today, 250,000 people went back to the Euphrates Shield area and to the Afrin. <clears throat> and I hope that next weeks and next months, we can discuss also for Idlib that how we can improve, first of all, the peace, of course, the security, mm -hmm. and then second, uh, the, I mean, health services, education services, water. If they can reach to the clean water, then you can go back to your homeland, your hometown. Uh, can I, if possible, I think it's important for the just two sentences with comments about the questions. Sure. Uh, one of them is, yeah. uh, I mean, thank you very much for your offer. Uh, as much as there's an, the need is increasing for humanitarian support, I think we need much more uh, NGOs and much more volunteers. Some of them as professional humanitarians, some of them as volunteers, and we need much more budget. I'm talking about not only my organization, I'm talking about on behalf of all humanitarians that I feel duty as to make advocacy for all kind of humanitarian affairs. That's why thank you very much, and I hope by any kind of drawing picture, donating money, I mean, giving your experience, 
That's why whatever you can support from different perspectives, which is, it is very much appreciated for integration. In fact, from migration studies... Can, can you leave the integration for the final remarks? Okay. Because there are uh, some questions and after those <coughs> questions. And I want to mention how significant is the, uh, that uh, child trauma regards, uh, in regards to the airplane voice in refugee camps because I see many kids actually in the refugee camps traumatized by the only the sound of the airplanes that they are having hard time and the Turkish government was trying to actually divert the planes not to go from that route not to traumatize those kids now I will get the last final round of questions one over there I know that we are a little late but there are so many questions so I'm trying to accommodate all of them yes okay hello assalamu alaikum uh, good evening everyone um, I know um, <coughs> there are many facets to the refugee crisis, and this is something that I've been following for years. And um, one thing that uh, we've touched on is education, but education with an end goal where you have a, an education school to work pipeline. Um, it's a model that can work in Turkey, it, it can work in a number of developing countries. I'm curious if um, there's any efforts, conversations going on where you can train individuals and plug them into the global marketplace. Um, there are companies such as Microsoft, SAP. Um, you know, I work with a company where if you develop the talent, if you develop that intellectual capacity and train individuals, um, you can have these people work and they can work anywhere in the world you know, and plug them in. Um, again, there are many facets, facets to the issue, and you can't necessarily solve everything in one, you know, one go. But this would be a great pilot, you know, or Thank a great a start to start developing jobs. And um, I'm just curious yeah. on your comments or if anything efforts are underway for that. One last question, and then we are wrapping up with the final remarks. The gentleman over here. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much for this educational session. I am quite sure that everyone knows the uh, significant role Turkey play in the Syrian uh, issue. But my name is Karid Lamad. I'm the chairman of Islamic Relief USA. And we have some work in, in, uh, in Syria. And uh, on top of my head, we spend five to six million every year. If there's any way to coordinate the NGO work together, especially from here, from the states. In this way, we be more sustainable, more into the development of Syria, and to get rid of these refugee issues in different countries. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. And with this note, I will get the final remarks for all of our panelists, uh, short, as short as possible. Dr. Oz, is your Syria work will spill over to other areas as well. We talk about the other areas. Can we say that from now Mr. Oz will be uh, informal representative of all of the people from Rohingya to Somalia and the traumatized kids over there? I will be honored to have that responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. And since we, uh, we have very little time, I'll, uh, mine will be almost a poetic answer. We can invest now or we can invest later. I think it's better to do it now. Okay, thank you very much. That means you will be in touch with Mehmet, you will be in touch with Burhan Ettin. Mehmet is on my speed dial. I was okay. texting him now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Burhan Ettin, final remarks and if you have any response to the questions. Yeah, of course, uh, starting from Turkey's uh, example in humanitarian aid, as the nations of the world, or as the people of the world, can cooperate uh, in, in our uh, humanitarian fields to do something for our future, to do something for our children. And you know, the world is full of many strategic calculations and interests, but we have to go beyond that. And this is humanitarian aid and, and development. Uh, let us hope that our leaders will come to that point sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bassam, one minute answer for Difficult no, actually, question. Actually, I don't have uh, something, but we talk about Idlib. Idlib is a very, very dangerous thing. Idlib didn't solve yet. And Idlib is not Turkish problem. The terrorist in Idlib is not Turkish problem. And the crisis mm -hmm. of refugees that expected to flow is not Turkish problem. 
And it's not fair that on the whole US media to, to just look about how Turkey will react to the Russian pressure. I think and I believe that the refugees issue in Idlib, that they are expecting three millions, it's one million reached to Turkey, it's, it's a huge disaster for everyone. Um, Turkey should be supported by US, by EU, in any negotiation with Russia. Russia uh, you, yani, Turkey, when it sit with Russia in negotiating on Idlib city, Turkey, uh, Russia is much bigger than Turkey. R R Turkey needs support, and the support is from the EU and from the US. And when I'm talking about the support, that I mean exactly that the Turkey, EU, the United States, they should sit on the table to decide how to do with the refugees, how to do about the terrorists, how to do the demarketing, the, the free zone or no fight zone between the regime and Russia because um, historically or the trend of Russia, they never respect any promise they did and we expect the fight will, will happen soon and we see that the refugee will come to Turkey and you see the terrorists will go to Europe and everybody will come and blame Turkey. To avoid all that scenarios, all the US and EU should endorse any proposal Turkey do today in order, in order not to pay the price later. So this Idlib, because it's very sensitive issues, if Idlib model succeed, then I think we have a new Syria with a new model that we are looking for. We are hoping Turkish to support us. I will answer the two questions briefly. Very uh, brief. Very briefly. We have many projects with empowering women to sell their own products through eBay. The, the women, they are refugees in Turkey. We, we, we support them. We, we told them how to sell their handmade products in the US market for Syrian NGOs. And we try our best to do it. So many people are doing this. For the other NGOs, I think, Turkey today, again, in the absence of US fund, there's so many NGOs. The problem with Turkey is there is, till today, there is no main address to talk with when it comes to the NGOs. Some people, they say it's the army. Some people say it's State Department or Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Some people say it's your organization. Um, there's so many ideas, so many NGOs. They don't know how to coordinate with each other. So this part of the government of Turkey to put framework for all NGOs to solve any problems in Syria. Thank Mehmet you. waived his right one minute to uh, Bassam, so we will end the panel here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the first lady to be well, here. I, I, I, I, should, I should say one, one sentence. Just one, sen one, one, just sentence. one sentence. Thanks for this opportunity. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are not living in ideal world which Polena or Heidi yeah, lived. True. Heidi was orphaned, by the way. Thank you. Second, we have a candle and we are trying to give that fire for other candles also and delay your new mobile phone and donate an NGO. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> we want to... We want to thank for the first lady to be with us today. We are grateful that you spent your time here you in your busy schedule. And thank you for our panelists. Please join me to congratulate the panel. <laughs>